Magna Carta was an abject failure. Intended to restore peace, no sooner had the wax set on John's seal than the king was dispatching his agents to Rome, seeking a papal annulment. England descended into civil war. Despite its failure in 1215, Magna Carta went on to become a potent symbol of individual liberty and the rule of law. As such, it has been adopted by radicals and reformers, politicians and protesters, judges and jurors. As Erwin Griswold, Dean of Harvard Law School, famously wrote in 1965, Magna Carta is not primarily significant for what it was, but rather for what it was made to be. It is this Magna Carta, the idea and symbol which is echoed down the centuries. Following 1215, the Great Charter was revised and reissued until its definitive version was issued in 1297 by Edward I. However, after this, the Charter gradually faded from political consciousness to the extent that Shakespeare doesn't even mention Magna Carta in his play, King John. Magna Carta made a striking return to the political fray in the 17th century, when Sir Edward Cook, a leading jurist, invoked the Charter to limit the power of Charles I. Cook saw the Charter as the embodiment of an ancient constitution. Cook argued that Charles's attempts to rule and raise taxes without Parliament were contrary to the rule of law. Dissatisfied members of Parliament agreed, and when civil war broke out, it was Cook's interpretation of the laws of England and Magna Carta that was invoked by parliamentarians to legitimise their cause. However, not all of those fighting for Parliament shared Cook's reverence of Magna Carta. Oliver Cromwell famously described the Great Charter as Magna Farta. Meanwhile, in America, echoes of Magna Carta made their way into the founding charters of the colonies. By the 1750s, the colonists felt that their rights as freeborn Englishmen were being ignored by the British government and a parliament in which they were not represented. Echoing Clause 12 of Magna Carta, the colonists called for no taxation without representation, and like the barons before them, took up arms to defend their rights. Back in Britain, reformers like John Wilkes and Francis Burdett employed the Charter in criticising oppressive laws passed by Parliament. Magna Carta was suddenly appearing on political pamphlets, tokens and even teapots. Magna Carta was not just for the radicals. Looking to forestall a repeat of the French Revolution in Britain, conservatives used Magna Carta as a shorthand for the benefits of British liberty. Across the globe, British imperialists did the same using the Charter and the inferred superiority of British liberty to justify both colonialism and Britain's civilising mission. In the 20th century, Magna Carta was deployed once again, this time in debates about the internment without trial of individuals during the First and Second World Wars and in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. More recently, Magna Carta has also featured in debates about the detention, again without trial, of individuals suspected of terrorism. In 2005, the veteran Labour politician Tony Bend warned that the Blair government's plans to extend detention without trial of terror suspects to 90 days would represent the death of Magna Carta. At the heart of this debate was the question of whether the right of the majority to security outweighs the liberty of the individual. Magna Carta's significance and those who have championed it has changed over time. However, a constant throughout has been the association of the Charter with the cause of liberty and individual rights. As such, Magna Carta is the most significant failed peace treaty in British history.